Well, I'm James Kumar. So I'm Senior VP for Products at DDN. So I'll talk about the challenge of AI a little bit high level at first, and then drop down into, you know, really the basic architecture of the Exascalar file system. And you'll see we, you know, under, underneath it's called Exascalar, um, and we brand it as A3i, which is essentially a packaging of the qualifications we've done with NVIDIA uh, and other IPU and GPU vendors, um, as well as the benchmarking, the testing, the optimizations we've done for that world. So when you see A3i, you can also think that's really the exascalar file system, but with optimizations for AI. And I'll talk about the architecture um, at a very basic level. So you can see, you know, really at the roots of how the file system works, it's well suited to these kind of challenges. So first, um, if you've come across the term the AI factory, relatively recent, it's essentially a way of viewing AI infrastructure, whether it be in the cloud or on-prem. And it allows people designing systems to you know, just analyze things in a methodolog methodological way. Um, and the analogy is made with a factory. So we have you know, on the um, right-hand side here, we have data coming in. The raw materials of the factory is the data. Um, that goes into a data and AI platform, the physical infrastructure or cloud infrastructure. Obviously working and um, running AI jobs, uh, managing processes, running IT are people, uh, and those people are driving a set of processes, which is essentially going to be this AI pipeline, which itself is quite a major topic. So the pipelines are running on this platform and then it produces products. So this is just a, a construct to let us analyze each area in some kind of logical way. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. But before we drill down, um, you know, I say we've got 16 super pods running DDN out there. That's by far the vast majority of them, around 90%. Um, and that's just the super pods, many, many more pods at smaller scale. And typically what we find is customers have performed a POC, and they've gone into production. Often they've been using um, the regular, let's say enterprise storage that they've been used to. And we tend to find they have these challenges as indicated on this, on this sort of little plot here. Um, firstly, there's just a straightforward performance problem. And it's an interesting problem because, you know, often people will look at the specifications of a storage system and it will have a nameplate number like, I don't know, 20 gigabytes a second or, um, a million IOPS, nothing, oh, well, that's fast storage, so I'll use that. Um, but what they're forgetting is, you know, the real problem is, can you expose that potential performance inside the storage appliance to the application? Because that's all the users care about. Uh, so when users say the jobs are way too slow and people scratch their heads, often it's because the data path between the storage and the application is not optimized. Secondly, Intermittent failures, network storage, I need expertise, something's wrong, troubleshooting. Um, now, this is something that genuinely that sort of 20 years of experience at DDN really helps at. Um, if you can imagine, we've been building these systems at extremely large scales, literally the largest supercomputers in the world for many years. And what you get from people and software is an ability to cope with these corner cases that crop up. Those corner cases happen when there's many, many clients. Uh, the networks are being pressured uh, very strongly. The applications are all over the place and tricky things happen. The second thing is ingesting this data. So the, the data ingestion process can be, um, if we think of an autonomous driving cu customer, we have one in Europe and they're really pushing hundreds of terabytes per second into a storage system. And that acquisition problem is very tough for many storage systems. So when you get a vehicle running through a city, it's got LIDAR, radar, cameras, and it's pulling in data from, from the streets. Um, often there's a, a person with a, an iPad sitting there um, checking out the supervised learning process, but these cameras are interesting gigabytes per second, the radar, and the LIDAR as well. When it gets into the sort of data center at the end of the day, often a single vehicle will have 100 to 200 terabytes of data in that vehicle. And all that data needs to be moved somehow into the AI infrastructure. 
in order to be processed, in order for that data to be applied into a deep learning infrastructure and for the models to be trained upon that data. So this ingest problem, I'll skip back and forth between these slides a second. This ingest problem from a storage perspective, remember it's a write problem. We're writing into storage. It's important to remember that because some storage systems are great for reads, but not so great for writes. We do need to have write capability, very, um, very important uh, fundamental point for AI storage is don't forget about the writes. And I'll come to that a bit later. And then the sort of one in the middle here is about siloization. And I think we see this repeated in the industry. One of the greatest challenges for AI customers is, you know, once we've got a, a POC running or even production system running, how do I scale that? How do I add in uh, new AI um, solutions into my infrastructure? And often the biggest barrier is how do I get to the data to the right data scientists? How do I share it? It's over here, it's locked away, it's in a different secure system, it's in a different region, it's siloed by the nature of the storage systems. So these are the typical issues we see. And just drilling in those various areas of the AI factory, this is you know, looking at the pipeline. The pipeline is acquisition, processing, training, production, and then storage. And it differs from traditional HPC workloads or even traditional analytics workloads. I'd say this acquisition process is a tough one, often hundreds of terabytes, or it might be in NLP, you might be bringing in as a finance institution, five or 10 million documents a day. Um, and that becomes many, many streams, a different sort of IO problem. But again, you're writing that into the storage. Okay. You're doing it simultaneously to all the other things. So when I look at your slides, and if I would use the, the usual terms of training and inference, I would say that the first three items are, are meeting the training concept and the, the last two items uh, inference. Now, the, the hardware requirements for inference and training are significantly different, meaning when I think training, I think lots of data, uh, but batch processing with GPUs, while on the, the inference side, it's more real time. Uh, and, and dealing with models. Do you see the same infrastructure or storage being used with training and inference? Yes, and you're exactly right. So deep learning, um, you essentially do often multi-epoch training. We might come to that actually. Um, so there's a certain sort of IO activity from a storage perspective. The compute to storage or IO ratio is high. So compute, there's lots of compute per IO generally speaking, in deep learning. Whereas in inference, it flips. There's not a lot of compute. It's fairly lightweight, relatively speaking, but there's obviously you're pushing lots of data through. Um, but we do deploy the same infrastructure. Um, how we architect that, the ratio of compute to, let's say, flash, um, the number of network connections will change between the two, the two models. Um, and you're right to point out that the, the latter part of this is maybe more inference based. Um, but of course, in reality, it's more complex as a feedback cycle. So often you don't really just store things and leave them. This tends to be very much active storage. Um, uh, it's rare that you will just park storage and never touch it. You will often bring it back into play to retrain models uh, later on once you've got more data added in. So it's kind of different in that way. The storage needs to stay active. You can't just park it in a tape library and forget about it. It's usually going to be used repeatedly. So you're saying this is a novel data challenge, but we've had like even, not even in AI systems, but we've had IoT like data streams coming in, smart meters, traffic monitoring, um, health data. So yes. what yes. is unique about these challenges, which I agree are challenges that is specific to AI that you're talking to us about? Yes, thanks. Well, firstly, I suppose we should partition AI. There's, there's AI, which is things like computer, consumer preference analysis, which tends to use structured data. <laughs> So like your IoT problems, these tend to be small data problems, essentially. Um, uh, lots of bits and bytes often going to a database. We really deal with at scale AI, and that tends to be dealing with unstructured data. So it can be files, documents, but often it's video, it's audio, it's LIDAR. So it's really the sheer volume of the data. So I mentioned autonomous driving, and I say real customers pulling in 200 terabytes per day per vehicle. 
multiple vehicles per city, multiple cities per continent, you can easily get, and we have customers doing this, hundreds and hundreds of petabytes of data, which you'd really never get from, let's say, a typical IoT scenarios we got. So the volume of data is huge. So I think we've had big data IoT that wasn't going into an AI system. So that's the sort of like this, the, the line I'm trying to get to here is that we do have videos coming in that aren't going into an AI system, like for instance, for record keeping and uh, logging and those things. And the same thing with manufacturing, with IoT, yeah. and maybe not, you know, like you've said, mega terabytes from a million cars driving around every day. But I'm trying to, to get you to give us what that distinction is for other very large unstructured data problems. So I think really the, the key is the word deep and deep learning. So the revolution that's made all this possible is the fact that they found a new set of algorithms whereby the more data you gave it, the better, more accurate the decision making became from an AI, AI model. Um, and that hadn't happened before. Before there was before the, the latest generation of AI came along, you know, the more data you gave it, it didn't get any better. Um, and deep learning is that. It is the more data you push in, the better your models get. That's even true for billing, but I'll give that to you. <laughs> so so somebody asked me to sort of point out what we do different. And I want to go to architecture as well, but high level first, exactly what we do different is, is here in sort of the next four slides. I'll run this room quick, quick and then take some questions. So firstly is, you know, our storage systems, you'll see some numbers later on, but we can pull in from 2U, something this big, 65 gigabytes a second. I mean, it'll do 3 million IOPS. Um, so that means we can ingest tens of millions of documents and video in real time. Um, so if you compare DDN with other storage systems and just look at a rack diagram and the, and the right figures, the right performance, you'll see we have a really extremely strong right performance per rack unit, per dollar, um, per watt or whatever it is. Um, secondly, there's a lot of stuff in here which we really can't go through in detail, but we've spent the past four years really building optimizations into these various areas of the AI data lifecycle. So it started maybe three years ago with us implementing GPU direct storage. So that's a, a mechanism for pushing data from the storage directly into the GPU memory, bypassing the CPU. We've done optimizations for, if you think about what's going on in this stack, you've got AI frameworks running inside containers, running on GPUs, running inside GPU systems across the network, across multiple rails to the storage. At every point there, we've got optimizations, optimizations for the frameworks. It's called MMAP. It's a special call, um, which is often used to map memory into AI frameworks. We've got optimizations for containers to push the data into those containers. Optimizations for GPUs like GDS and others, and optimizations for the systems, like taking advantage of multi-rail, moving data in parallel into these systems. So there's an awful lot here, which we'll give you a few hints of, but it's too deep to go in, into in detail. And then in terms of storage, we've also, and you'll see some pictures later on, um, we've got an architecture which gives you the speed of flash, but allows our customers, which I say, they often have, you know, even tens of petabytes, but hundreds of petabytes, still we're in an age where doing tens of petabytes with all flash is rather prohibitive. Um, so we can archive those effectively, but within an active storage system. I'll show you how uh, fairly shortly. And then how does storage really help those key issues for our customers? Well, they've got data scientists, they've got to find them, they've got to keep them, they've got to keep them productive. Um, all that effort we've done in optimizing all areas of that workflow really helps hey, James. us. The ingestion is, I would guess, heavy write types of workloads, but the, yeah. the training would be heavy read workloads. I mean, are you optimized for both of those in an exascalar solution? Or, and, and you know, some of these are large files and some of these are fairly small file images and things of that nature. So that's the other a dimension of optimization that needs to go on. How, how do you play in that multifaceted yeah. IO requirement space? Great question. Um, so the, you're right, quite right. You've got to do it all. You've got to do writes. You've got to do random writes. You've got to do reads. You've got to do random reads. You've got to do metadata. And you've got to do IOPS, read and write. Um, and more than that, 
you've got to deliver all those things, not from a storage perspective, from the application perspective. So, but just, you know, to answer your question straight, um, in that 2U system, which is scalable, we do 90 gigabytes second for read and 65 for writes. We do 3 million IOPS for read, and we do around 300,000 file crates per second. To answer it very straight, um, that's in the 2U platform. And it scales as a parallel file system. Um, but really underneath this is what optimizations have we done in the data path. And that's really where the difference comes with this parallel file system approach compared to let's say NFS approaches. And I'll try and explain that in the next few slides. And I'm, I'm assuming that let's call it GPU direct really applies to more of the training side of thing rather than ingestion. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily. It's just a, so for throughput heavy workloads, um, large streaming images, then GPU Direct tends to essentially accelerate things um, by, a, let's say, a factor of 50% additional throughput. It varies on the storage system, what advantage but, you get. But as um, Ray says, it wouldn't be used for the ingest, it would be used for the training. Exactly, it would. Yeah, and just a, a question about some of those performance numbers. I mean, are those entirely purely random uh, reads and writes? Oh, no. should, uh, to take into account multiple uh, multiple applications attempting to work on the data at the same time. Um, I mean, where you, just coming up with performance numbers without actually kind of framing it doesn't doesn't explain a whole lot about the performance. You're quite right, by the way. Uh, and I already said this myself, from a storage perspective, here's the nameplate numbers. We'll do 90 gigab gigabytes a second in sequential read from 2U. We'll do 65 per second in sequential write from 2U. We'll do 3 million random read 4K IOPS in 2U. But you're absolutely right. That doesn't matter. What matters is what the application sees. And I think the best proof point of that is actually data from NVIDIA running MLPerf. Um, so we've got the leading numbers for 16 out of 16 out of the benchmarks in combination with the NVIDIA on a Selene system. And of course, if we were to talk about real you know, individual applications and benchmarks, MLPerf is probably one of the leading ones, not exclusively, um, and we're effectively leading that. Let me jump down, because I want to talk about the architecture of Exascalar. Um, this is really the core to tell you kind of why we get these numbers. So what are we doing special that's allowing us to get these, these sort of numbers and more importantly, push that data into the applications rather than just have it sitting in the storage as potential. So Exascalar, Exascalar 6 is our latest version, is a parallel file system, but it doesn't, it's not really a one-trick pony. Um, it does provide throughput and IOPS and metadata. Um, we've got a comprehensive management framework, online upgrades, uh, rich GUIs. Um, we can move data within the system between pools um, completely transparently to users. We have client-side encryption. We have SED encryption, multi-tenancy, call home, real-time monitoring, quite a strong set of enterprise features. And the main point I'm going to make, I'll go into a little bit more detail on what this really means, is it's parallel. So what do I mean by parallel? And many, many systems claim to be parallel. And we've kind of added the word true <laughs> to differentiate ourselves. The difference is... And I'll mention this a couple of times and explain it a bit more detail is we install an intelligent client, if you like, on the compute side. And that client scales with the compute and it helps the whole system scale. So it's about scale, it's about performance. And that's really the magic, this intelligent client that helps us move data into the application. Essentially, the application is mounting a mount point on a, on a compute system, on a GPU system. But that mount point is essentially exposed directly by our software. And our software is working across the network with a virtualized networking layer to the storage. So our storage really expands into the compute. We, we install software on the compute. And that James, means, so go ahead. Um, where's the metadata? Ah, good question. I've got a slide on that. I will come back to that. It'll become very okay. clear in about four slides time. And you mentioned the, the, the intelligent client that runs to, uh, is the, I'll say, is the data sharded across the, Good Where's question. I've got an answer to that soon. We're going to come back to it. Maybe pause just for like uh, maybe three slides and I'll, I'll explain everything. All right. Um, so the one thing you can see from this diagram, the main point is A, each of these threads in the application layer are working in parallel. Remember, remember that point one. And B, there's nothing else in this diagram. There's our systems here at the bottom. There's no back end network that I've not drawn. 
there's no back-end uh, JBOFs or networks that, that aren't here. That's it. You connect our systems to the network. And because of the magic of a parallel file system, uh, that's, that's what you need. Now, underneath Exascalar, so about three years ago, we acquired a file system called Lustre from Intel. We've always used this uh, for 20 years, actually. Um, but we've been accelerating its development for the past five years, and then even more in the past three years since we acquired that team. And that's what Exascalar is based on. So underneath at the core of Exascalar is Lustre. And you can see this is all kind of AI related, is these little claims quite recently from Intersect 360, from IDC, basically saying, for some reason, NFS isn't quite good enough. We need this sort of intelligent client approach, which is, which is what we do. So typically, um, in most AR environments, you have a lot of storage and not all that storage is processed at a particular time. So people use tiering. So in, in your case, you use Lustre for the front end, you know, call it the POSIX based on Lustre. How do you connect to a, let's say, an object store uh, through Lustre? Because I, very, think, very good question. because I think Lustre natively does not support object tiering, I believe. Right. Um, so we do it a bit differently. So I'll, I will come back to that as well. And I'll show you how we tier and how we tier in a better way than having fixing two namespaces together. Sorry to defer that question again, but I've got a picture of it um, in about three slides again. Um, the point of this is saying there is Lustre at our core. We have the major development team for that uh, in the world, but then we build on that and we, we have a commercial version with additional features, et cetera, called Exascalar 6, which runs on our appliances. Right, now we're getting very basic and this should be where things get much clearer. So we are a POSIX file system um, and we've got the attributes you might expect from something you'll mount on a normal Linux system. We've got quotas, we can do space management, we've got integrity and checksums, we can run snapshots. Um, everything feels normal from the application perspective. It's just a file system like a local file system on your laptop or, a, or an NFS file system. But a parallel file system, uh, thanks for the question earlier on, essentially shards the data. So in this little cloud above, the file system is mounted on the clients, the application writes uh, into the mount point. That's essentially picked up by our intelligent client and it's sharded across those servers. Now, the important thing, which I'll repeat maybe three times is our intelligent client understands data locality. It knows A, where to put the data in the first place, and B, where to read it from subsequently. That intelligence is key to parallelization. If you have an NFS client, however fancy, it doesn't know where the data is. It's gonna go and ask any server. But because this data isn't there, that server then has to do something else to retrieve that data. But essentially a parallel file system is, that, is this here. We're sharding across servers and the client, a true parallel file system, the client knows where the data is. So in fact, our architecture is a bit like this. So on the, on the clients, each individual thread will write into the software which is running on that compute system. Our Exascalar client will then talk to the metadata server, find out where to put this data, and then it will stream in parallel the shards of that, and it will stripe them in a round robin fashion. In fact, rather sophisticated methods inside here, but according to policy, it will stripe the contents of those files. And the same is for reads, or read in parallel for multiple servers. So James, and, it, and it writes directly into some servers and they will then erase your code onto a set of storage underneath. As the underlying architecture then, so you've got this idea of the clients are intelligent. They know where the data is. They've got to find out. So they will talk to a metadata server or more metadata servers than one. Let's come to that in a second. But essentially okay. what are the kind of services? Can I ask a, um, apologies for the, such a basic question here. So when you say it knows its intelligence, where to put the data, is that because it's optimizing for performance or is it using that intelligence for, you know, to make some other type of decision? What it's doing, so when I say it knows, it actually asks. Um, it asks the metadata server, which is managing where the data is across the system or the metadata servers, I should say. Um, and the metadata server will tell it the layout of a particular file and that then that client will then sort of follow it, follow the orders of the metadata server. Now you asked, you know, how is that optimized? Why do you do it intelligently? And the answer is very much so. There's a lot in there to unpack, but I'll give you a couple of examples. If you have 
a file with a, an index region at the start, which is randomly accessed, and then you have uh, a set of, let's say, image data after it. That's a special kind of file. And you can apply a policy um, in Exascalar to say, let's, if we're given just the first part of that file, then let's just put it replicated or triplicated across three servers. And then as the file extends beyond that, we get this image data, let's stripe that. And that's great because what you get is super low latency for index queries, just from that triplicated set, and then super big bandwidth for the remainder of the file. And that's exactly what we do. So you apply policies at the directory level, file level, and then the clients will essentially run optimized data into the system. So, so basically your client is a metadata cache. The client will, will cache metadata. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's the whole point of the, the, um, the client that you actually install on the host is the, the metadata cache. Um, well, it'll cache metadata, but it'll also query the metadata server, of course, if, if it's not in cache. Okay, well, I mean, by querying the metadata server, it populates into cache, got it. Yes. So, in fact, if you really want the detail, it's here. Um, but essentially, the, the point about this slide is not to go into super technical detail, right? But what it is, is to say we have scalable metadata servers. So you can have 40 metadata servers in a single parallel file system. So it might be racks and racks of systems in a data center. It might be very compact. And I'll, again, I'll show you how we do this physically soon. But there's many metadata servers and at a sing, in a single directory, we will shard across the metadata servers. And as you expand, we'll automatically consume uh, and balance the metadata load across the multiple metadata servers. So there's a question earlier about, you know, how do you, how do you scale that metadata? Well, we, we do it in a number of kind of complex ways, but A, we shard within a directory, and B, we shard across a file system in, in fairly sophisticated ways. So the whole point of this is to say, you know, an individual thread running on an application can now see the bandwidth of the parallel file system. It can gain the IOPS of the parallel file system. It can get scalable metadata requests from a single thread. And that's really the key. The point is not the storage system is fast, but it is. The point is we can actually push that potential into an individual thread or an individual client. That's really the key difference of what we do versus NFS. So how do we do this physically? Um, We've been doing this approach here in this picture for uh, many years. And essentially what we've done, as you can see in that picture, is those services, metadata servers, object storage servers, the management servers, and indeed the servers themselves are all virtualized. It's all running inside this one system, this one to you system. So all functionality, fully resilient, no single points of failure in to you uh, or flash. In this example, we have other examples of hardware implementations. But essentially, the answer is we virtualized all these services. And that means our quality assurance is very, very robust because we've got one system, not a myriad of different server options. It all gets packaged in here. And the customer's experience is a lot better. Um, they just deploy this. And if they deploy that box there, they're going to see 90 gigabytes a second of throughput with enough clients. And they're going to see 65 gigabytes a second of write and 3 million IOPS. Um, so inside this system here, just this system alone, is 24 NVMe drives, so that's gonna be um, 700 terabytes of storage or so, without anything else, nothing else, just all flash, all NVMe, right in this system, just with that to you, connect it to your network, and you'll see these numbers, 65 and 90 gigabytes a second. Right, so that's the first answer. The second answer is, what if you do want to scale? What if you want to scale using HDDs? What if you've got hundreds of petabytes of data? Um, then you can use these expansion options. Um, so essentially attached to that controller with the flash inside it, you can have these 90 bay enclosures, up to 10 of them. And then you get to, let's say this one on the far right here is going to be providing something like 16 petabytes behind it. And there's a little bit more to this than, that William will probably mention, um, which is around hot pools technology. We can move data transparently in the background back and forth between flash and HDD. So the expansion, happen it's not object it's it's still it's still POSIX right you're just using HDDs right. as opposed to NVMe slash flash exactly and that's a good thing um a we can expose all this data through S3 so it's not as if it's not accessible as an object it is um but you're not handling two namespaces the best result the best reason for that the best consequence for the customers is when a user reads data and it's not 
in the front end cache, it's not in flash, there's very little penalty. All we do is one namespace. So all we do is read directly from where it resides in HDD. There's no, I'm gonna retrieve that into flash and then right from there, there's no big latency. So when you have systems which move it back into an external S3 archive, the problem is when users do wanna use that data, all of a sudden it's fault out, wait for S3 calls, populate the primary, then serve the data. We don't do that. We just serve it directly from HDD. Right, so so data that is then frequently used never gets promoted. So once on hard drive, forever on hard drive. No, we've got this this hot pools which William will mention will watch the activity of data across a system and will promote cold data or hot data, sorry, in the cold pool and bring it into the hot pool. So we have a background activity working to do that. But the worst case anyway is you read from HDD. Okay. So there is steering, it's just that consumers are not aware that it's happening. It's transparent, yes. Right. I mean, it doesn't have to be. They can promote it themselves with an API, but yes. Now, I mentioned this intelligent client, and there's one fun aspect of having this intelligent client. We can do things which others can't do. So this is a picture of Insight. It's a, a web-based dashboard for monitoring management of our infrastructure you can see in this picture you know you're looking at power supply health and this kind of stuff how much capacity you consumed um, but the fun thing is here and we could talk about insight for an hour but we're not going to um, this is the differentiated piece when an application sends data into our file system our client will also tag that request with the user ID, the job ID, the client ID, and that gets accepted by the server. We pull it into a database and we can present it back. So 